Now the next speaker is the present Mars Tsar, uh, Jim Green, which I always think is a hard job in a group like us because of course we want many things from him. We want him to tell us that we will be on Mars really soon and that he has it all figured out. Well, the pathway is there, so I do have some trust. But before I call him to, the, uh, uh, to you uh, here to give his speech, I want to tell you that some of you didn't pick up your Occupy Mars. That's benign. We're not, you know, we're friendly. Uh, Mars mug. Uh, the funniest, um, it changes when you put your liquid in, right? It terraforms Mars when you put liquid in. So we're not totally benign, I think. I mean, occupy Mars. But uh, still, um, when you picked up your folders, you weren't made aware of these uh, um, mugs from uh, SpaceX. So, uh, I mean, terraform Mars, why not? It's easy, apparently. Um, anyway, Jim Green is perhaps going to tell us how to really do it, or that would be a few steps too far, I would think, but uh, he will tell us. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, I think the topic of the last panel at the end was just a perfect setting for what I'd like to talk about today in my short few remarks. Uh, you know, um, the burning question, as Mark mentioned, for many of us is, beyond Earth, is there life in the universe? Or are we alone? And, you know, many people, many scientists even, believe that we will answer that question when we find an Earth-like planet orbiting a star hundreds, maybe millions of light years away. But personally, I believe they're wrong. I believe we will answer that question, and I believe it will be answered within our solar system exploration. And I believe Mars, which is a special, special planet, is number one on my list, and I'll tell you why. But first, I'd like to start with a little history of life on Mars. You know, as telescopes got to be very good, and we begin to uh, look at our solar system much more closely, uh, in the late 1800s, uh, the Italian astronomer Schiaparelli began to publish his first maps in the 1870s or so, and, and described features that he saw between large uh, uh, discolori discolorized uh, areas on Mars, thin lines, and he called those canali. And, uh, of course, uh, Percival Lowell in the United States uh, picked up that topic, observed Mars, uh, observed it for many, many years, and he wrote his first book. He wrote his first book in uh, uh, 1895. You can actually download that from Google Books and read it. It's fascinating. It, uh, Percival Lowell decided uh, to pull all the best scientific information together that he could at the time, and of course extrapolated on that, and in that extrapolation he believed there was life on Mars. And complex life, life perhaps like us. Uh, he believed it had a substantial atmosphere, and he believed the Canali, because he observed them also, uh, to be uh, areas of irrigation. Now you can understand that when you look at our own satellites and look down at the Nile, and you, you don't see the Nile directly, but you see the results of the Nile as it overflows its banks. But these Martian hunting water lovers eventually came to Earth. Only two years later did H.G. Wells decide, hey, this is fantastic, we need to write about this, and of course, um, from his perspective, that turned into fabulous science fiction and a number of very fascinating movies along the way. And in fact, um, uh, Orson Welles and a radio adaptation of that scared the living bejesus out of us. But what was really going to happen next when NASA got to the point of launching its first spacecraft and we started to get to those places in our solar system and examine those up close and personal was really 
uh, when the, uh, the action started happening. And in fact, our first set of observations from Mariner 4 and 6 and 7 and eventually 9 really indicated that um, Mars didn't have canals, was much more moon-like, cratered everywhere. Uh, some hints of, um, uh, of fractures, cracks, perhaps, uh, uh, from, from water, but really a barren, barren place. Now, this really set us back from a science fiction point of view, uh, but it also allowed us to step back and say, what are those essential things that we should be looking for when we trek out into the solar system? And, of course, it really boils down to these ingredients for life, we need the water, that's essential to what we know, and I'm speaking from the perspective of life as we know it. We need energy, and that means uh, not only light and heat, but, but the ability to uh, uh, generate uh, the appropriate material to be consumed, and we need the appropriate chemistry. You know, Carbon-based life is what we know today. And so if we methodically started out and looked for these three, these three elements and, and their abundance in our solar system, we could really get a feel for whether life exists in our solar system or not. And uh, Viking was a huge step. And this particular uh, set of two landers, uh, along with two orbiters that were uh, carried to Mars and dropped off, Viking 1 and in uh, 1975 and Viking 2 um, uh, soon after, uh, landed safely and began digging in the dirt and began analyzing it and, and began to take a look at whether Mars had organic compounds. Did they have the stuff that life is made of? Now the results of that, of course, are rather ambiguous and, at best, uh, but we now know so much more about Mars. Because we didn't find what we lo were looking for right away with Viking, it actually set the Mars program back for many years, almost a decade. But then we went back to basic principles. Let's go look for the water. Let's follow the water. Let's look for signatures, uh, whether, whether from orbit or uh, uh, the ground truth, if we have our our, um, our rover Spirit and Opportunity looking around uh, all, in addition to Pathfinder and really take a good look at um, uh, what resources uh, Mars had in its past in the area of water. And, and what we found was abundance of evidence that Mars at one time had a significant amount of water. And in fact, we now know today it still has a significant amount of water trapped in various locations, underground, uh, small amounts in its atmosphere, but in the polar caps also buried under the CO2. The evidence is all over the place. We see uh, gullies that can be carved out only with flowing uh, water material. We see deltas. We see areas that look like they have been carved by swiftly moving water. And more recently, we have observed new craters uncovering material that in days sublimates. And when we take a good look at that material, we find that it is water, nearly pure water. So the observations from our fleet have really confirmed that Mars had a water, it was a water world in its past. And in fact, from a geological perspective, we believe we can put together a notional notional evolution of this body in the Noachian and Hesperian time frame, we see this potential abundance of water uh, where clays and sulfates can form. But then something happened, some major global change, some major climate change occurred that changed it from a water world into a more arid world that we see today. But the evidence of the flowing water is still there on Mars. What's exciting is, of course, we know that the clays and the sulfates can retain organic material, may be able to house and keep safe that past record of complex biomolecules, perhaps. We know the clays, of course, form in water. 
And so it's an exciting time period to go back to. Why didn't we find that on Viking? My take is Viking landed in modern Mars, bathed in ultraviolet light and cosmic rays. And what we need to know is enough about Martian history to know where to go, where the past has been preserved. And we can interrogate the Mars of several billions of years ago. And that, of course, is what we've uh, started to do. Um, if we were to think of this Earth and how life started on this Earth, and we wanted to go back in time, and we wanted to see a geological setting for which life at that time may have arisen several billion years ago, where would we go? Well, it turns out it's very hard to find those locations. Here on Earth, there are only a few very old locations where, where that, that structure, that geological environment has been maintained uh, over the billions of years. But on Mars, there are many locations. There are many places. Our scientists debate over where to go. And that's what we did when we picked out the landing site for Curiosity, is let's go back in time. Let's find that location of Mars that has preserved that past. And of course, Curiosity landed at Gale Crater. And in this location, it found a number of fantastic things right off the bat. Here we see Mount Sharp ahead of um, Curiosity. Uh, it, uh, uh, here's a couple of the uh, drill holes. And the scientists became incredibly excited about this immediately. And the reason why is this color is gray. It's not the red Mars that we know. Mars was different in the past, and it's just below the surface. Curiosity had the ability to bring that material in and analyze it in great detail and understand its mineralogy and its structure. And of course, it made major discoveries, as Mark mentioned, right off the bat. It indicated that Curiosity landed in an ancient river or lake bed with rapidly moving water in its past. Think about that. That means the atmospheric pressure must have been much greater than it is today to be able to have liquid water on its surface. There must have been clouds. It must have rained. It was more Earth-like than in any other time in its history. And as John Grotzinger told everyone on a press conference, this water wasn't very salty, wasn't very acidic. You could drink it if you were there at that time. Looking back, this area is several billion years old, perhaps three and a half billion years old, perhaps older. We also found in areas similar to this, key chemical ingredients for life, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, all the basic ingredients that we need. Mars now looks very different today than it ever did before. And it's much more realistic to think about what to do next. And for that, we need to study the Earth. We know at, on Earth, when we look for extreme life, whether it's at the bottom of the ocean, or it's in uh, nuclear cesspools, or it's in uh, several miles down below the Earth, extreme environments that we see also in space at other locations, that life here on Earth is very tough. Life does exist all over the place. It's tenacious. It survives very long time. And life is metabolically diverse. It eats anything, and it breathes anything. When conditions get tough, life moves into the rocks. And that's our next approach. Our next step is finally here to interrogate the body that we know of Mars today, we need our next mission to be able to drill and create cores, to be able to sample those cores and sample from contact instruments and understand what happened in its past, cache those cores and bring them back. 
And it's from that we will study what life may have started on Mars was all about. And that might tell us how life started here on Earth, too, by the way. We are on the precipice of some great discoveries at Mars. And the life question, I believe, is one of them. The solar system is ours. Let's take it. And Mars is that next big step for us to go to. It is the one that we will see whether there is life beyond Earth. Because the conditions that we are so familiar with are there. Now finally, soon after Curiosity landed, this appeared on the internet. This is a true story. Now this is a beautiful shadow late in the day with Mount Sharp uh, ahead of us and, and casting the shadow as Curiosity. But someone from the Mars generation saw more to it than that. This is what an astronaut will look like. He or she will have a tight-fitting suit, will be communicating perhaps back to Earth, certainly to orbiters, will have tools in their belt, and they will have their very best pet dog rover helping them along the way. And that is our next step. Thank you very much. I think I have time maybe for a question or two. Good. You were a two seater, apparently. Now we've got some. Well, actually, two related about the, about the Mars life question. Uh, some recent um, uh, revelations, I guess, from the Mars orbiters and Curiosity. One is about the organics. Curiosity found some organics, but it was unable to determine if they were brought from Earth or, um, you know. Uh, generic to Mars, and there was some recent research that it might have been generic to Mars. Have you heard about that one? Okay, so Curiosity and the SAM and Kemen instruments, right. which have great capability, are continually uh, operating. Mm -hmm. They're working well as they're moving to Mark, Mount Sharp. Right. And they're making observations not only of um, the soils, but also the atmosphere. You know, trace gases are important. Right. You know, we had heard at one time that Curiosity didn't see methane. Methane's an important yeah. uh, potential uh, life um, uh, trace that we want to we want to examine. But things change as you go on through time. You know, the yeah. atmospheric conditions change. We yeah. want to be able to go through a season. We want to be able to yeah. see what happens over time. Yeah. We need to be able to mount, make it to Mount Sharp. Now, when you look at Mount Sharp, you see the stratigraphy. Mm -hmm. You know, that elementary chart I showed you of the Nowaki and Hesperian and Amazonian, that's our notional idea of what the geology and changes on Mars has occurred over the last four billion years. But when we get to Mount Sharp, we're going to be able to walk up and read the geological pages of the history of Mars and put these things in context understand more about whether water stayed, was uh, eliminated in, 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 in a major climate change, or went through periods for which it went through dry and wet uh, over, over many uh, hundreds of millions of years. Mm -hmm. So um, the story's not done, okay. and Curiosity is well on the way of making, uh, making some major discoveries, not only on the way to Mount Sharp, but when it gets to Mount Sharp. Yeah, a second. Question related to the life. Um, there was um, also some recent images from the orbiters that there might be gullies, not just forming in recent times, but actually currently forming in yeah. present times. Uh, uh, we see what are uh, what we uh, call uh, um, linea. Right. They are streaks that appear to come down the sides of craters mm -hmm. that are several football fields long. They occur, uh, I think we have found at least 12 or more locations uh, when they're on the crater walls, when the crater uh, wall is more closely uh, perpendicular to the sun. Right. So we believe that's briny water. We believe the sun is uh, 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 sublimating the water plugs mm -hmm. that are allowing these aquifers to pour water out. Right. And everywhere where we've gone in this planet and found water, mm -hmm. we have found life. 
And so we believe Mars has a lot of underground water resources. We're just learning about them now and where they might be. Okay, thanks. Now, yes. Hi, my name is James. I'm a well, soon to be graduate from uh, Rutgers University. And um, I was just wondering, because you had brought up maybe someday astronauts will be on Mars and they'll have their pet maybe? rovers. Maybe? Is there a question? <laughs> with their pet rovers next to them. Yes, yeah, so right. Um, and that got me thinking, has, has there been any research or advantage to, or exploration of the advantages of uh, using uh, technology we currently have, like uh, drones, or is the atmosphere too thin to use airfoils, or something like uh, the robots that Boston Dynamics is producing, uh, which are more animalistic mm -hmm. and they don't have any wheels to get over obstacles. I was just curious if there's any work. Yeah, actually there's been a, a, some major work that's been done in several areas. One, of course, is indeed um, uh, UAV-like planes that can go great distances. Um, another one is actually balloons, for which the, during the day they, they heat up and, and the balloon rises and takes a gondola of experiments along with it, and we observe what we observe, you know, and, it, and it's really up close. Uh, those, uh, those are still viable. Uh, we still have opportunities coming up in our, in our calls for innovative ideas, and, and I wouldn't be surprised to see something like that in the, in the, in the upcoming discovery call for proposals. Yes. Hi. I, I saw something uh, that just kind of mentioned this in one of your slides, but I was wondering, you know, how important is uh, sample return to the kind of science that you want to do, or do you think that a lot of the similar stuff could be accomplished by continuing to iterate on, like, the Curiosity technology? Mm -hmm. Well, I've walked into the laboratory at Goddard Space Flight Center before they created SAM, and I saw what it looked like, and it was a huge room with tubes and pipes and valves and things, and they were able to shrink that into a box about the size of a microwave and is sitting on Curiosity now. But there are laboratories that we have today, we cannot do that. We know there are limitations. And so consequently, bringing back the samples will enable us to unlock many more details about what's in the cores over time, because indeed uh, Mars has evolved geologically over time, and as you go deeper into the rock, you go back in time. And of course, uh, that also allows us to, as more laboratory equipment becomes invented and created, it gives us an opportunity to continue to interrogate. Uh, the National Academy of Science uh, actually came out with a report not too long ago that said that they believe we're going to want to bring back samples uh, before humans arrive, and particularly in the areas where the humans uh, might be. We're going to need to know enough about Mars so that they don't trudge out into the beyond the hab and then bring carcinogens back in with them. You know, um, uh, exploration like Mars uh, human exploration is not Star Trek. It's not go where no man has gone before. We need to know everything about the environment before we show up. And that's why I'm delighted to see us, the scientific approach, which is really becoming much more thorough in its understanding of Mars, its, its past, and uh, potentially its future, uh, will really greatly facilitate human exploration when that occurs. Thank you. Yes, Buzz. Would you estimate how many uh, living habitat main bases you'd want to operate out of? I assume it's less than 10. Uh, do you think you could pick those, and what would be the highest latitude? OK. I'm looking yeah. for a so, landing. Yeah, latitude, we've always thought it was important. We've always thought that, you know, uh, uh, the water table, which is where you're going to want to be close to, um, is such that uh, we believe that the water table drops very low as you got towards the equator, but came close to the surface as you got to the pole. We're seeing now that that concept is, um, is not correct. We're seeing that, indeed, there perhaps is even some buried glaciers that are quite extensive that are even at, at mid-latitudes. Uh, 40 degrees or so. You don't have to go up to 60 and 70 degrees. 
So once again, the more we understand and know about Mars, rather than bringing all our water, we'll, we'll be able to say, bring your straw because we'll know where to go. Now the number of habitats, uh, there's, there's an endless array of exciting places to be on Mars. And, and, and so that approach is going to be uh, dictated by length of stay, purpose, the geology they want to interrogate, uh, the mobility they need, and um, safety. One quick, one quick one. Um, what is, is there any possibility of, or anything with terraforming, and if so, what would that look like? Okay, so you're asking a scientist, do I, uh, do I like terraforming? Well, um, that's not what I'm all about. Uh, scientists love to understand everything about the environment that it is and, and, and the context that has occurred. So paleoclimatology, the, the exciting thing about what Mars had and how it lost, how it lost it, that's the exciting science for me. Now there might be other generations of scientists that will say, now that we know everything, let's terraform Mars. But it, it won't be me. Thank you very much.